Okay, so let's go into population ecology. So you guys got the general concept that ecology is the study of interactions between living things and their environments, right? So between living and living, as well as the living and non-living. And then I would say, um, so far what you've been talking about, what's kind of an e a community ecology, because like the community is all the organisms in an ecosystem. So you were talking about the skin and all of the organisms that live on the skin. And really that was to delve into um, the community interactions as well as the definition of an ecosystem and that it is self-sustaining and it has like distinct boundaries. So ecosystems, like, you know, when you've walked into the forest, it has a distinct boundary. You know, when you've walked into the lake. Um, and in that sense, our skin would may, because I know when I'm, I've reached my skin. Anyways, today we're going to talk about just population. So population is a single species. So if you isolated like that e, e, e. coli, sorry, I was trying to say ecosystem. Um, if you isolated the E. coli from your skin that they were talking about, like that would be a population. If we talked about the people at Hazlitt, that's a population. If you talked about the gray squirrels that are in the woods between the middle school and the high school, that's a population, right? So it's a group of the same species in the same area at the same time. And um, I think we've done the species definition maybe in evolution that they can breed and reproduce and produce fertile offspring. Um, within a population, because they are in that same area, that same ecosystem, they're gonna rely on the same resources. So there may be some competition. Um, they do interact with each other. There's breeding, right? There is working together um, to produce a common um, goal, like some hunt in groups, right? Pack hunters, or like you have um, the prairie dogs, starts with an S. Does, do you know the one that like sets out and he's like the lookout for the rest of them? It starts with an S. His role in the group. No. They're super cute. They're like sitting out like high up looking. They're the, the I forget. Or the bees, they work together, right? In the, um, in the hive. Okay, so you got the idea of they all interact. Um, so the goal for population ecology, so like if you were an, uh, like, why would you study it, right? Why, what do population ecologists do? They probably are looking at specific cases. Maybe they're trying to bring back numbers that have declined. Um, maybe there is a need for the organism for food, fiber, medication, any of that sort of thing, right? So they're looking at specific cases and they're applying general principles. And typically the general principles can be applied to any population. That's the idea. So um, these are the things that they might use in practice. Uh, organisms that provide us with resources, obviously we want to understand them better so that we can support them the best we can. Those that are endangered, we wanna try to bring back those numbers. So we need to understand what is bringing the numbers down in the first place and how can we bring those numbers up. We have, um, a need to keep organisms that serve a purpose in the ecosystem itself. Pollinators, those that are pest controls. Um, so like some that will already eat other organisms that are a pest, um, as well as sometimes we have the pests that are overpopulated and we wanna decrease their numbers. So we have to understand population ecology in order to tackle any of these goals, basically. You guys did a biotic, so I'm gonna skip it. Here are some things that you didn't cover. So um, what can we measure within population ecology? And we will do some math when we come back. So we can measure um, population density, which is you get the concept of density. How much is in a given area, right? So the numbers per area. Um, so we're interested in the cause or consequences of local abundance. Um, population size, just simply how many there are, right? So the density times the area occupied. So um, 
the rat, I can't see their numbers anymore. And that's really just because it's too small of a graph for any of us to see the numbers. Um, but you would be able to take like this red number and multiply it by the whole area that that organism um, is found in, right? And then the geographic range, this is showing you it can be found within that range. They do that a lot with like birds. Like if you were wanting to identify birds out in nature, you're going on a little track. Um, you would see the range that you could find any of those birds in. Same thing with plants or flowers. Um, you know, wildflowers, you go and you look for them. So if we know where they can be found, um, we can kind of look at what are the environmental, like the abiotic factors of those areas. And that helps us to know the needs of the organisms that are found there. So why do they pick the areas they pick? Um, lots of ecological interactions maintain the, the geographic boundaries, like the temperature, the rainfall, the food, the predators, blah, blah. Um, and we will notice that there is a dynamics to the density. The population may change over time or it may even change within a year. Like we know about migrate, migratory patterns, right? So like this guy here, he needs the ice to fish. And um, if the ice caps are all melting away, he's going to leave, lose his fishing resources. And that's going to um, be a detriment to his ability to survive. And these guys need a totally different set of adaptations to be able to live in a tropical humid area where they have a plethora of organisms to choose from. So the other thing you would look at is population density. So um, on the worksheet I give you today, you have, I think, some population density graphs to look at. Uniformed, so they're kind of equally dispersed. I think I have a slide for each one. So random, there's no particular pattern and clumped. As you can see, they're found in a small group. So this is like your herds. Um, so the clumped distribution is the most common when they're found in groups, right? So like the swans on the lakes are usually found all together. Um, the buffalo are usually found in piles and you look at schools of fish and you can usually like, when you look across the mountainside, it's not like the whole thing is covered with purple flowers, you might just get um, a patch. So clumped is found, um, it's characterized by patchy resources. So you don't have the same, like the birds are probably following fish, right? And if the fish are found in schools, they're also going to be found in schools or, you know, clumps because there isn't any fish outside of that area. This is probably where there's the most moisture or the pH of the soil is the right pH because leaves fall on the land like pine trees make the soil very acidic and so we don't even find grass underneath the pine trees right because it's too acidic a soil so the environmental conditions maybe these trees play a role in the soil um soil type and that's why we would found, find those only in um patchy areas so the uniformed is even distribution they're kind of equally dispersed. So in that first picture, maybe the penguins looked like they were in a clump, but overall they're gonna spread out. This gives them like maximum personal space. Um, so it's kind of due to territoriality, right? So they're gonna like get, hey, my squirrels are doing this right now in my backyard actually. They're like chasing each other away from the food source because they want their space. Um, so this is often due to competition. Um, between individual organisms. So it maximizes the individual space. And then the random is unpredictable. You wouldn't be able to say, I'm gonna find a, a maple tree there or there because there, there's not like the resource um, connection, I guess, you know, it's more random. Probably the bird ate the seeds. And that was a question you guys answered recently, I think. And it's just like, where it dropped its droplings, um, that's where then the tree would have grown. And then these guys are just random because they have all of like this whole grassland, any of it is good for them. So they don't have to be in any specific space. So evenly distributed kind of, so they are like hmm, here and there, wherever I feel. 
So occurs in habitats where environmental conditions and resources are consistent. So what practical reasons do humans wish to influence the abundance of some species? Why would we want to increase species numbers? Maybe we're eating them. Mm -hmm. What else? Maybe they're a food resource for an organism that is declining in numbers. What aspects of abundance do population density and population size measure? So what is population density measuring and what is population size measuring? How about virtual world? Population density, what does it measure? Yes, Sophia. Um, number of organisms per area. Yes, I love she used her raised hand feature. And then what does population size measure? What's the population of Hazard High School? Anybody know? 1, yeah, it's 900 something, I know that. So maybe it's 990. That sounds right. Um, so that would be our population size, right? It's just the number of individuals. Okay. Due to my visual impairment today, um, the chat box is really difficult. So I appreciate the hand raising or the voice up on the virtual place. Um, today is a little bit more than usual. Here are some of the things we're gonna be calculating. What time do we go to? 9.15? Okay. Um, some of the things we'll be calculating when we come back, I, I'm gonna be honest, I didn't feel like getting into math because you guys know I'm not really that good at explaining it. I'm okay at doing it, not so good at explaining it. So I'm gonna wait till we come back from break. But um, so things that affect population size, you guys can probably figure out like if there's births, the population numbers are gonna go up. If organisms come into our area, immigration numbers are gonna go up. What could cause declines, deaths, immigration, COVID. We would need to be able to calculate population growth. So um, the R is our population growth. And then, um, so you might think of that as rate. I don't know, it's not, but that's kind of what the R, if I think of it, it's not a rate because there's not a time involved. But R is population growth. Um, and then you want to see the change in the population, which is gonna be birth, births minus deaths, because you're gonna increase minus those that leave. Um, and then N is the number of the original population. So that one's pretty easy. Um, birth minus death, that's how many are coming and going times the total population. And then the growth rate, this is where we have Rn. So the rate of change is, you know, delta is always gonna be a change. So the change in numbers, so there was 750 and now there's 700. So there was a change of 50 over the amount of time. So if this was one year or one month or five years, that would give you the rate of change, which you could calculate off of a graph, right? Rise over run. And we did a rise over run question in one of our math test questions not too long ago. Okay, so those are some things we'll practice with. I got a whole sheet of them, so woohoo. So things that can regulate your population size is um, you have limiting factors like density dependent. So this is gonna depend on how clumped the group is, right? You are more likely to get COVID if you are clumped together. That's gonna be a density dependent factor. So illness, parasites, food, mates, nesting sites, anything that's relying on competition, the more there are in a given area, the less homes there are available, the less mates there are available, the less cobs of corn there are available. Predators, parasites, and pathogens are going to be more easily transferred if organisms are clumped together. So these are density dependent. They will change depending on the density of the organisms. Density independent is going to affect everybody the same. So whether we were clumped together outside and we got rained on, or we were spread out and we got rained on, 
we're all going to get drenched, right? So that was independent of how closely positioned we were with each other. So abiotic factors pretty much are going to be density independent, the amount of sun, the wind, all the weather patterns. Those are going to affect everybody the same. Okay. Um, nothing I really need to say about those pictures. So then you have the growth rates that can be graphed. So exponential growth rate happens when there is no limiting factors, right? So like bacteria in a pizza dish, when you first put your bacteria in there, there's as much nutrients as possible needed. So they are going to grow exponentially. They're going to reproduce every 20 minutes and double their numbers, just like our, our uh, PCR was doubling our numbers of um, DNA. So without limiting factors, organisms can have this J-shaped curve, which, which is characteristic of exponential growth. Also happens when you introduce um, an organism to a new environment or when a group is rebounding from a catastrophe. So um, invasive species, right? They're coming and all this new nutrients is available to them. They are going to grow exponentially. It's also because they don't have predators in their area. Okay, so we started protecting the, Africa, the um, African elephant from hunting and their numbers really started to rebound. The whooping crane is one of the great successes of the um, Endangered Species Act. So invasive species, non-native species, um, they outcompete the native species. We have purple loosestrife and gray um, in Lake Lansing. That is a native species and now you can, I'm sorry, that is an invasive species. So you see it all over the place. Um, the zebra mussels that are in all of our new lakes or our Michigan lakes, um, that's a non-native species. So it doesn't have natural predators in the area. So it can outcompete and consume because all the other organisms that have always lived here already have predators in the area, right? Um, sometimes like with vegetation, maybe it's just they reproduce more quickly or they have um, like a strong, stronger growing system, if you will. This is the kudzu, which you can find pretty much all over Florida now, and it is not native to Florida at all. So it's now like growing over top of all of their own vegetation, um, which is not what you go to Florida for. You go to Florida to see palm trees. All right, so we're familiar with the zebra mussels and the purple loosestrife. Also, the gypsy moth and the African honeybee are coming in and out competing the um, native versions. The zebra mussel, you can see here back in 88 when I graduated, it wasn't even a thing, like one little bit over here. And then 92 when I graduated college, a little bit higher numbers. 94, I started teaching higher numbers. And I was teaching up here in Northern Michigan. And then 99, I've been at Hazlitt for a year for no particular reason. Like these aren't actually my numbered graphs. I'm just making sense of these graphs with my own life. Um, anyways, so we can see how the numbers have really increased and they're pretty much following the waterways. Um, they've come in on like the ballast water of ships. And so they've gotten into our own waterways now. And we can see how much accumulates in a short period of time. So not only are they causing damage to our own ecosystems, but they're also causing economic damage. They accumulate on, I mean, this is just garbage that is in the water that has no purpose of being in the water, but your own ships or um, boats, I, not ships, but you know, your pontoons and your speedboats, it's all getting, um, getting in there. So it's reducing the diversity because it's taking away many of the organisms within the population, or I'm sorry, within the community. And species diversity is gonna be a big thing. If you're reading any FRQ, diversity is a good thing. So anything that decreases diversity would be a negative effect. Um, so it also creates a loss of food and nesting sites for other organisms that are in the area. This is our great, Lake Lansing area with the purple loosestrife. 
which is quite pretty, but the negative effect is that it is decreasing the diversity of the area. So you're making that food web much less complex. So if there's environmental changes, they can't, you know, there isn't an alternate food source for any of the organisms in the area. This is what um, the Lake Lansing area used to look like, the same area. Um, you can see more water available, more variety in the vegetation um, outside the area. And this is purple loosestrike today in Lake Lansing. So this is in 78, you can see the change already. Starting to close up this waterway. So again, reducing the diversity, not only does it affect the food source, but also the nesting source. So like the organisms that used to live in this area, um, you know, like the red winged blackbirds want to nest in the cattails. And now you're taking away that, that site. Um, so our logistic growth, you can see change in number over change in time. So that's your growth rate, basically rise over run. Can they continue to grow exponentially? Of course not. At some point you will reach a carrying capacity. That is all that the area can support, whether it's because of food sources or because of habitat sources. Um, there's only so much, so much land. Um, so K here, K is our carrying capacity. So a population may increase until a carrying capacity, and you should be able to identify any of these points on a graph. At that point, the environment can't support any more organisms, and so they will begin to dwindle and die off. So you should see an increase in number and then a leveling off at that carrying capacity. So it creates more of an S-shaped curve, and that's logistic growth. So exponential growth is the J and, and this is our logistic growth. And so with logistic growth calculations, you have to include the carrying capacity in your calculations. The nice thing about the AP nowadays is that they give you that formula sheet and these formulas are all on there. So remember we talked about density dependent factors. Those are probably gonna play a role in this logistic growth. So as I just said, it is carrying capacity, basically how many organisms can be supported within an environment without degradation of the habitat. So once you start destroying your own ecosystem, it's going to support less and less organisms. Makes sense. A lot of ecology just makes sense, I think. So things that can cause change in carrying capacity. So the predator-prey relationship is a really big one. And usually you'll see graphs of predator-prey on quite a few standardized testing things. So this would be a population cycle. So the lynx in the hair, for example, creates an oscillation, you know, oscillating like this like a sound wave. So what we'll see is, so the snowshoe hair is the um, prey, right? So you should see peaks in prey before peaks in predators. When there's not very many hairs, right? The lynx has nothing to eat. So they're gonna have a decrease in size. And because the lynx are decreasing in size, the hares have the ability to go and be happy and eat all they want and play and mate. And so their numbers go up. And at this point, because the lynx numbers are low, right? They don't have a big risk. And so their numbers are going up and up and up. So there's a lag between, there's some lag time between the peak of the hares and the peak of the lynx or the peak of any prey and the peak of any predator. So now there's lots of snowshoe hares. So then the lynx are gonna be eating more and surviving more and reproducing more. And so their numbers are gonna go up. And then the more of these there are, the more snowshoe hares get eaten. And so their numbers drop. And so there keeps like this, you know, they're oscillating together with one, the predator just lags behind there. Okay, so we can identify the carrying capacity. Um, so anything above that is going to change the habitat. <clears throat> okay. Life tables. 
survivorship curves, I think like maybe last year was the first time or the year before we did this in ninth grade. Um, so you have survivorship curves, which I'll show you on another page. Um, proportion of population surviving from birth at different life stages. So you might've done that. We did the pyramid. Um, so different ages, like how many are young and how many are old that are surviving at a certain area. And fecundity is the average number of offspring each individual produces at those life stages. So survivorship, how many are surviving and fecundity, how many babies they're producing, you know, at two years old or four years old or 10 years old, okay? So this is a life table and we can see there's usually less males at each age group than there are females. Oh, except for here. Oh, that's deaths. So usually there's more um, male deaths than female deaths. Any idea why that might be? In an ecosystem, why at every age group, the male has a shorter lifespan than the female. Look at age two, um, this ground squirrel only has a life expectancy of a half a year. Whereas over here, it's 1.6 years. Are they competing with bison for mates? Could, so they're like dying, fighting? Yeah, it could be that too. Mm -hmm. Yep. The male is usually the one that is going out and doing, and the female is usually staying home with the babies, right? So it might be the competition with other organisms of the same species. It might be um, going out hunting for food to bring back to the nest. And so they might be an easier um, predator, prey. They might be easy, more easily preyed upon or maybe hit by a car or something like that because they're more adventurous than the females, basically. Because that's their role in life, to be the provider, right? <clears throat> so if you have pretty much a straight line in a survivorship curve, it's basically a consistent rate of death. So at any age, they could, like they kind of have the same um, death potential. Usually males lower survival rates overall. So these are three different um, survivorship curves. So look at the bottom here, this is the percent of maximum lifespan. And on the left side, you have the survival. So oysters, for example, are type three organism. So they're having lots and lots and lots and lots of babies, but very few survive, right? So maybe this is like our sea turtles also, like lots and lots and lots of eggs, very few survive. So they have a short lifespan, many die off, very few survive to reach reproductive age, which is probably why they're having so many babies. I mean, not like that's a choice, but that's probably why nature has evolved that way. The hydra has that straight line, meaning constant rate of death. We have less babies survive to a greater age. So our reproductive age, and then we start to die off. So kind of the opposite of the type three. So you should be able to talk about any one of these three graphs, kind of having to do with reproductive age, in these two, this is dying off before, this is dying off after, and then the straight line is just constant rate. So there isn't a benefit or over one age or over the other, basically. So these are the age structure diagrams. You want to recognize that one side of the graph is male and one side of the graph is female. So like if they said, what percent of the population is um, 20 to 24 years old? you're gonna to need to add both the male and the female side. So pay attention to questions, what percent of the, pop, of the male population? So then you wanna just look at the one side. So what we see here, this is a growing community. So there's lots of babies being born. And so they have a chance to increase in numbers, right? So that's gonna be growing. This is a slow growth. Um, so less are, are being born. And then this one is zero growth. It's more consistent from top to bottom, basically. Okay. 
This is showing you how old they're living. So less are less of the population is old, more of the population is young, which means the young population is going to grow to be old, right? Here you have kind of, you don't have as many more at the young age than at the old age, but this is still more than the old age. So that means it's still a growing population. This population is about the same as the old folks. So it's not really changing one way or the other. That's basically what it's telling you. So the trade-off survivorship versus reproduction. So there's a cost of reproduction. Um, increased reproduction rate may decrease survival because if you have more organisms or more babies, right? You have to have um, more support. So you have to have more food. You have to have bigger um, habitats, things like that. So things that can affect the, um, the survival is the age at first reproduction, the investment, like how much energy is used per offspring and the number of reproductive cycles in a lifetime. So these are all going to affect how many organisms um, or how many offspring an individual will have, right? So like the sunflower doesn't have a lot of, it doesn't require a lot of energy to produce all the babies. So it had a whole field of them, whereas the bear has to have a lot of input in keeping the baby safe, keeping them fed, the gestation period, all of that. So there's less of them available. Um, and I'm not gonna go into this one. This is more of that same concept that it's just more work, more work. Um, so then the last thing I think this is, is the R and K strategist. You might've heard of these before. The K strategist like us is late reproductive age, and fewer offspring. So they're super cute. I don't know what they are, but they're super cute, these little guys. Some re relationship to the primates. You can think of K for Kim, that's me. Slow reproduction rate. <laughs> Invest a lot in raising offspring. Um, so the R strategists are these that reproduce a lot in a, sh in a short period of time. They have an early reproduction and then they just keep producing. Um, probably more than will survive, right? So they're probably like a type three and then the case strategist is probably a type one. Okay, so little parental care is needed so they can have as many babies as they want. Many of your plants are, are strategists. Um, many of the larger organisms are case strategists. Sometimes I get too many animations. And I feel like we kind of already talked about this. Again, a lot of that has to do with the energy um, and the amount of space needed. So I'm gonna go ahead and skip past those. Human population growth rates, you can see we're increasing, increasing, increasing. Ah, it'd be interesting to compare this now because I've, our numbers are changing quite a bit in the last year, right? So do you think maybe we've reached our own carrying capacity, right? And so the environment has a way of bringing the numbers back into stability. So maybe we were kind of growing exponentially. We had the, the black plague that, that decreased us in numbers. Industrial revolution, that's where we start seeing a large increase in our population because now we have all kinds of things available to us. Medicine is increasing our, our life expectancy, technology, all that jazz. I got to update this. We reached 6 billion in uh, 2005. What are we at now? Seven point, do you know? So we're currently adding 82 million um, per year. That's 200,000 per day. That's great. I don't think we really need any of this for our testing these days. Um, we won't get into the ecological footprint. It is interesting that like down here, you have more densely populated area using much less of the resources up here. Um, we have a lower population, but we're using the majority of the resources and producing the majority of our carbon dioxide emissions. So we have a very high um, ecological footprint. If you, today, that was a lot of content. I know it was hard to sit through all that, but I did want to make sure to hit all of those points that we maybe hadn't hit um, 
in our fun exploration of the skin because it was interesting and I really enjoyed listening to you guys have conversations about that.